So welcome to Mobility as a Service. If that's not the session you signed up for, don't worry. You're probably too hungover to move. You should probably just stay where you are. Um, mobility as a Service is ultimately getting to think about something fundamental, how the way the world moves, as something that we should really truly think about. And these are kind of tales from two journeys taken in the field of mobility, uh, one with Uber, one with Lime, and contrasting solving urban mobility problems in two different ways. So first, a little bit about me. Uh, so hello, all of you. And this is my first time presenting as a non-Californian, so I'm like so excited to be in California. <laughs> They're like, relax, like we get this all the time. So this is my first time you know, traveling uh, to speak at Max, which is great. And I think there are so many interesting conversations that are about, some are about work, but they're about interesting areas of work, like tools and new ways to approach work, or that's so interesting that so-and-so only uses these three you know, keystrokes, and just these kind of shortcuts and these things that are more like green room conversations than, than capabilities presentations or anything that a presenter is doing. <clears throat> So there's gonna be these uh, slides called definition slides. These are helpful in case you wanna just glance, take a picture of them and, and tend to these later. The mobility, I think we have to unlearn maybe a familiarity with mobility in terms of telecommunications mobility, right? So we're really thinking about the movement of people, goods and services. And we're thinking about all of those movements, movements happening simultaneously in different ways. So we'll talk about the different types of mobility. We'll talk about multimodal, which is just a fancy way of saying planes, trains, and automobiles all on one platform. We'll talk about micro-mobility, which is about solving and stitching together those gaps in mobility that you see in urban infrastructure. A little bit about me. Uh, I wasn't always this tall, um, but I spent a lot of time here with family here figuring out how we were gonna move um, from this parking lot to Wet n' Wild. Um, been blessed to be around a lot of magical folks. This one actually is called Magic, um, for those of you guys old enough to get this reference. And then, you know, a dad who taught me that it was okay to, to stand out, whether it was on the basketball court or my mom, who was uh, dragging me across the graduate stage. Uh, I think a lot of the problems that excite me are the ones that are wearing this little, little Earth Planet guy. With Earth Planet goes this, like, Dr. Planet. He's like, oh, I feel so bad. And Dr. Planet's like, I'm afraid you have humans. And it's like, this is our perpetual problem. <laughs> Like, we are a parasitical force on this planet that's just trying to get by. And how do we use design, the languages around design, or just conversation in general, to try to figure out what we do with these wicked problems? Um, so the project that I thought was the hardest project before some of these projects was actually working with, uh, with Pat at Impossible and trying to figure out that if industrialized animal farming does more damage than anything in terms of the amount of water resources, the amount of methane production, then we actually have to not cater to the people who are already maybe eating plant-based meat, but we have to take a Whopper or a Big Mac out of someone's hand and we have to replace it with something that they think is equally as tasty, which we were like, good luck. There's no way that's gonna happen. Um, but they believed and they pushed us and he said that your brief, you know, you've seen a lot of briefs, but your brief is to change the way the earth looks from outer space. That's your brief. Um, so we ended up making a logo that's an homage to the waters of the planet and the land masses of the seven continents. So in some ways, it's a nice reference to our data visualization of how well we are doing. So these big, wicked problems, you know, oftentimes are abbreviated by the overview effect. When astronauts talk about looking back at the Earth from a far enough distance, and they call it, you know, pale blue dot. They say that all these national boundaries, these neighborhood fault lines disappear and they're overcome with a, a feeling of love for the earth and the people that inhabit it. That somehow seeing it from a distance does something to them emotionally. So this is what knocked on my door, um, which was Wolf Olin's, which was a, a shop that I had heard about doing fantastic things, reimagining museums like the Tate, et cetera, et cetera. But the company that always seemed to say yes to those impossible briefs, whereas everyone else was probably smart enough to run away. Um, and I was getting to a point where I was starting to solve things at different scales. So thinking about being appointed to the national board of the AIGA, what does that mean to think about the future of the design profession? By design profession, we're we thinking about graphic designers, we're thinking about interaction designers, we're thinking about people adjacent to the fields of design versus people that have creative cloud. I teach in the graduate program at Yale, so with second year MFAs. And it's interesting to teach a research institution with such an art school focus within a larger body of students that sometimes does and doesn't appreciate what design has to offer. 
and a Wolf Olins where I'm a global principal and head of design. So at three different vantage points to have a lot of conversations about design at different altitudes. But these guys uh, wouldn't go away, and by these guys meaning both the Beatles and Wolf Olins. So the Beatles were actually, um, depending on who you talk to, our first or second client. Um, they really put us on a map. Um, so they came to us at the time when the word branding was just starting to be used. And they were trying to come up with a name and a brand for Apple Records. And then later, Wolf Olins would reimagine the Tate. And up until this point, it was thought that the only way you could organize your collection was chronologically. That you would put you know, your classics in one place, you put your modern in other places, but you didn't see your collection as something that could be remixed to be able to juxtapose unfamiliar things to make a point about their connection or maybe the audience. And we recently wrapped a project for Modern Fertility for two ambitious founders that were graduating from Y Combinator who wanted to reclaim the discussions of fertility from the doctors, the institutions that had become the de facto answers. And so this is just a little sampling of some of the work that I've been a part of, but also that I got to inherit. Um, the Met was launching and was full of praise and controversy. USA Today um, had landed, and I think driven some interesting conversations around this new language of simplicity and flatness. Attempting to brand New York City, and then the Olympics and Refinery29, celebrating them as they moved into Vice Media, and we'll talk a little bit about this project as well. So I think the one common thread that we have through all of our client partnerships is ambition. So it's not scale, because we work with you know, two founders, a Y Combinator as a two-person company, um, you know, juxtaposing that with, with a company like Apple, um, that it's not about scale. And I think that's one of the things that I think all designers need to ask themselves is, what is the requirement for, for Entree? Is it, is it scale? Yes, it might be for somebody to thinking about systems thinking and some of the intricacies of how to localize a brand. And for us, it's ambition. It's how much do you believe that resetting kind of the normative temperature of something um, is worthwhile? So a lot of my clients you know, can afford to have really beautiful, immaculately taken headshots. Um, but part of my task is actually to be the buffer around them. Because um, oftentimes, their teams live in fear of them. Their teams are you know, wondering what's happening at that altitude. And so it's both managing up as much as it is managing down. And I would always say the best piece of advice, one of the two pe best pieces of advice, which uh, I will say, is meet with the most senior stakeholder of any engagement as soon as humanly possible and ask them two questions. One, which is a no-brainer, which is, what does this project mean for the business? The second one is, no one will ever tell you to ask this question, is what does this project mean for you personally? This is you one-on-one -on -one with the CEO. That is the question to ask, because you'll get a whole host of surprising answers that their entire team may be completely blind to, towards. Um, so you'd be surprised what some of these people said about the projects that they were, that they were leading. So I think because we've been able to mask the, the marriage of strategy and design, I think our design has been noted because it's been a powerful expression of a compelling idea. I think we're probably getting to the point where we've seen too many beautiful things on Instagram to believe that you can just put a logo on something and that makes it a valid solution. I think we're looking at which companies can actually execute systemic change. One of the tools that future designers love to use, and this is kind of a flattened version of a Voros cone, um, is a probability cone. So what you're looking at is you know, time as a linear continuum. And you're taking certain scans in this continuum. These might be things through social listening. What are people saying on social media? Um, what are the company's financials? How are they doing internally and externally? And at a present moment in time, you're looking at something that feels to be inevitable, right, where it says probable. And there's something about that probability and about the exactitude of that probability that feels terrifying, right? That's the origin of a brief, right, is to actually be able to alter what is probably going to be a probable outcome, right? And the brief says, we would prefer it if we were able to reach these people that are being overlooked. Or we would like it if this were to move into this particular generation, et cetera, et cetera. And then you start to get more and more ambitious. And then things start to become less and less plausible and less and less possible. And then you just run out of runway where things just aren't actually possible. So any brief can come through any bit of light probability, more preferable, barely plausible, barely possible. I think it's the team's shared ambition that defines, is this trajectory valid? 
So one of the projects that I love to look back on, and kind of history smiles well upon this one, um, we saw the controversy that happened in the design community about the logo for 2012. I mean, there was everything from stuff that was sexually suggestive, there was stuff saying it looked like Zion, there was stuff that was saying that it looked like anything, any, my, my, you know, my sister or my brother could have done a better logo than this. But I think one of the things that's fascinating about it is getting a chance to hold the strategy document for this project. And the strategy document said that specifically the Olympic Commission was looking to engage an audience that actually didn't care about the Olympics, right? So you weren't designing an Olympic logo for your parents or your grandparents. And these have been the logos that I think I would have loved to have designed, you know, the 1972 Otto Eichers and the 1968 Lance Wyman's. These are the ones I held up as Olympic greats. And I always was perplexed in terms of this form until I realized that the whole idea behind this Olympic strategy was to create the everyone's Olympics that the people who are actually the best demonstrators of the Olympic spirit might be the Paralympians, might not be the athletes who are going for the big sponsorship deals. So the whole mark was really a celebration of this everyone's Olympics. And to date, it's been the most financially successful Olympics of all time, because it's been the only time that the Paralympics has been properly marketed and sold out, which is both a shame that the Olympics is succumbing to ableism and some of the other isms that we don't like, but also that it was being judged purely on graphic design terms, but not as a total, a total vehicle. So we get a lot of strange calls. This one was from Bobby Shriver and Bono saying we wanted to create a brand um, called, it's currently called Project Code Red. It's about saving lives. It's about people communicating what they buy as a demonstration of who they are as people. So roughly creating a category called conscious commerce. And the difficult part here was to broker all these B2B relationships, either with Tim Cook and then Steve Jobs or the CEO of American Express, so that they would have tier one partnerships that were proof that Red was actually going to take off, because this had just been a bunch of you know, sketchy partnerships that none of us had heard of. It wouldn't have demonstrated that commitment um, at that level. And the last project, last two products I'll talk about before getting into mobility, um, was being tasked with a consortium of engineers to say, we know you probably know everything there is to know about the Internet of Things. And I said, yes, and that was a total lie. And then on top of that, how do you create an open version of that closed Internet of Things? You know, the Internet of Things where like your Samsung doesn't talk to your Apple, doesn't talk to your Google. So how do we get out toward, towards a more interoperable future where everything is talking but everything feels, feels safe? And so I imagine, as our design team did, that you're in an aisle of a Best Buy or a Target, and you're just looking to get your first smart light bulb and you're looking for anyone who can give you a clear answer as to what smart light bulb you should buy. And they say, I know a person, I'm gonna ask so-and-so, and there's this moment of panic that happens <laughs> from the, the employees who are trying to help you because they're looking for like an IoT expert. Of course, there's very few. And so why not be able to text somebody who says, this is the symbol that you should look for on the package, right? So to let the, the brand be a signifier of this passes this new protocol standard. And we asked ourselves, could we actually tell this to a five-year-old and explain you to have a you know, hardware layer, a software layer, and just two devices connect over radio? And someone goes, oh, that's great. It looks like a little face. I said, we're presenting to engineers. The last thing we can do is talk about it in human terms. We can't talk about it as a face. Of course, you know, as a room full of engineers that go, it's a face. We love it. It's so easy to understand. So we survived the face appearance logo. And as a nod to the fastest growing smart technology market, we actually put the kind of emoji-like mark to the right of the logo type, which is a nod to, uh, to China as actually a leader in green energy and green technology, which would make sense if you stopped and thought about it, but they're actually driving a lot of these protocols for more energy efficient homes and structures. And so we oftentimes like to make a bunch of you know, speculative objects. What would this logo be if it picked you up at your hotel room in Las Vegas? would be a tape dispenser. This logo would account for both salpas and righties, right? It wouldn't have favoritism towards the side. What's the conversation a toaster could have with a coffee maker? So these are the types of narratives that our team was running with uh, for the greater part of 2017. And then we had a client that showed up and said, you know, you probably have never had a client more difficult than we are. We are actually trying to create a new category like you guys did with Red, which was conscious commerce. And we believe it might be something, some type of new technology. We're a biotechnology that actually is so advanced that we're maybe no longer even technically a biotech company because of the way that our platform uses machine learning. 
Um, and so we thought, my goodness, so you haven't made any products yet, but your technology already right now is so advanced and unmatched, you're acquiring an amazing amount of funding. Um, so we said, well, first thing, we need every employee to know the, this, the story. Why are you different? And so we decided to create a Z that was the three parts of the story. So high throughput experimentation, machine learning, creates industrial renaissance. And those are the three parts that the CEO wanted to believe is what Zymergen stood for. And so part of the task is, if they're going to be creating a new category called molecular technology, that's what we ended up on, they were gonna be tasked with not the marriage of biology and technology, but the technology of new molecular structures themselves that they would be um, helping to, uh, to edit and bring forth. So a lot of the posters were for events that wouldn't happen for another three to five years. Um, and I think a lot of these projects show the brand has kind of evolved as this you know, continuum. If you think back to Nike, you think back to Bill Bowerman making those waffle soles. And you think about um, then Carolyn Davidson probably doing the cheapest logo in the history of corporate America, right? the $37 $7 logo, right? the swoosh. She was later compensated, of course. Um, the idea that you stand for something bigger than a signal. So you make something of high quality craft. You need to create wayfinding for it so we don't go to the uh, Adidas aisle or the Puma aisle. But then we need to stand for something bigger, something than just like a company that transacts. So you come up with an idea like Just Do It, which stands for athletic empowerment. But then you have all these divergent you know, architectural things that feel like a federated ecosystem of things. How do you bring them together as one united platform? And now you're seeing this platforming of brands. You're seeing it happening. A lot of stuff with Google is doing, a lot of the big tech players. And so, of course, Nike followed suit with Nike Plus. And then now you're thinking about brands owning context, like owning that moment at 618 when my alarm clock goes off. Why does it go off at 618? I don't know. But that's the moment that my Nike training club kicks on, and that's when I have a relationship with my coach. Or it could be you know, Wednesday night running group. And so brands are starting to own these very unique contexts, these moments in time. And this is not a linear continuum. You've seen some brands, you know, like Google, might start a platform, move back to idea, and back and forth, et cetera, et cetera. So about 2017, this is kind of the abbreviated comic strip that I saw in the news, which was the type of company that, you know, I wouldn't touch the 10-foot pole, um, because it looked like everything that touched it was just becoming part of this larger tornado of discussions around toxic culture, discussions on leadership being emblematic of a company, the, you know, the hype around unicorns that are pre-IPO, um, the next big thing, et cetera, et cetera, on Market Street. But the one fundamental thing, as I started to kind of blur my eyes on the big, you know, giant figure at the top, was the fact that the world is saying, hey, like, you're deciding on how the world is going to move, and we want to have a say about it, and we think a lot of people should have a say about it. And so we asked ourselves, this could easily be kind of a clandestine, you know, project where someone goes and works on this, and someone will work on this, but we believe we could solve it correctly if we're able to be very severe about the rules of the road, the rules for engagement, then this is actually something we would take on with great enthusiasm. Um, so this is how I chose to see it. I would be the snail on the left side, not the pragmatic, smart snail on the right, who's like, dude, what are you talking about that it's such a tape dispenser? Um, it's like, no, I see, I see myself in this tape dispenser, and that snail is just shaking his head. Um, and, um, so why I love these problems is on demand is like, like threading the, the, the improbable needle between like two humans that are highly excited. Someone, human that has something and some human that wants something in a moment in time that is, you know, soon passing. And this is this new reality of on demand. We're no longer talking about scheduled mobility, which is do you have the bus schedule? It's like people are determining their own schedules, right? Their agreements between one another. Or as Lando Ehrlich you know, demonstrates in his beautiful insulation swimming pool, sometimes you can experience what it's like to be in the pool, and sometimes you can look down at the people that are above. And all these on-demand structures allow you to see things from different vantage points. There is no one type of solution. So we actually decided to pitch the company with three things to help ourselves understand what we were excited by, things that terrified us, things that felt too close to what they already had. So we started off with a U, which felt like that was harking back to their very first logo, which was a big red U. Uh, most people don't remember that. It's back from like, you know, 2008. Um, and it said Uber Cab. And they ran into an issue with the SMTA. They changed it to Uber, and it was a red Uber um, uh, logo type over a big red U. And then it became the U that had the fangs pointing back, and then it had the bits and atoms. So when we approached it, there had been so many permutations of shape and form and type. 
we thought, well, U has got to be one of them. This bit thing they keep talking about is probably got to be a middle one, and there should be something that we don't even know how we're going to land, right? So we present something that actually scares ourselves. So we started where you might expect, um, unifying things around a single piece of, you know, like a typographic gesture, like things that felt U-like. And we wanted to remind ourselves that they did have motorcycle taxis, they did have freight and logistics, so we couldn't just think about rides as part of the solution. And then we use these tools, and I think you know, this is a discussion we had with uh, the team, which is live surface is great, and these tools are great, um, and these tools that give us an ability to see things in dimension with kind of perfect lighting. There's also a danger that your tools can sometimes get you designing in a certain way. You start to think of, what am I going to wrap this car with? Or what am I going to wrap this truck with? You start to think about excessive amounts of vinyl that you're going to use in these applications. So the, the apps start to push you to design them in a certain way. Or you start to realize that these are car and form factors that are very Western, right? Um, we're not seeing any tuk-tuk apps, right? And so one of the things that we talked a lot about in Brand New Conference was the emergence of new apps that are more you know, contextual to where you are. So everyone is not designing the same moped um, that's all in Berlin. The second question we asked is, what if it was you to the power of Uber, right? So not the company to the power of itself, but actually putting a person in this field and asking, what is, what is her to the power of Uber? And so if we started to ask that question, we're unifying this letter form, the logo type, and this blinking cursor becomes the way to get in and out of all of their product suite, from freight you know, to moto, and you can build the whole architecture from that system. And the system would allow us to use something that could celebrate the cities that we're partnering with. So think, think about cities as, adver as, as colleagues versus adversaries. So Bonneville to the power of Uber is like these autonomous cars could take you out to the salt flats, right? So you're always thinking about the city to the power of something or a person to the power of something. Where to stand curbside at the airport, which we believe was a big problem. So we had a blinking cursor that was blinking curbside. Thinking about these blinking moments that unify ways in which you can travel all across the world. And then could ethos also be something that could be amplified? So the last one I told you was gonna frighten us um, was actually opening up Wrinkle in Time. And this is when Meg is trying to understand how these, <laughs> these three basically like super witches are like time traveling. And they're like, this is how we time travel. If it took us all the time in the world, like the top illustration, the ant would have to go across the whole string. But if we bend time, right, then actual bent time could be representative as that little U drop. And for us, that was the U is actually a bent line, where it's a bent journey, which actually communicates the benefit of why you would choose the service. And so these are just some, some states that we put together. Uber's waiting. Uber, me home. Uber hears a command. How long before the car or the food gets there? What do we really want to know? And then the U is just a completion of that particular trip. So it's not a company celebrating its own presence. It's the completion of the action that you needed to come to a close. So waiting, hearing the command, the countdown, and then the completion. And we got excited because we can imagine actually being inside that self-driving car from earlier and actually saying, OK, we can tell that the car is awake and is ready for your command. We can tell that this trade dress is the completion of your command action that you might have at the beginning of the app. We can tell that this line is somehow aware and sentient. It's listening to the sound of traffic. And this countdown could be something that can be a tool to create excitement. How long before the playoffs get here? But then back to a greater context, right? So we had a CEO who was inheriting a bunch of you know, loyal you know, faithfuls to the, to the founder CEO. So there was like a mixed ethos. Um, you had a chain of public scandals, both internally and externally, demoralized workforce. So there wasn't much morale happening internally. And he had elevated market share uh, competition happening from Lyft and from a lot of competitors in Southeast Asia. And so this brief, um, which I think many of you have seen a lot, which is what I call the supermodel brief, what is that today we're a functional service, but tomorrow we want to be a beloved iconic brand. And it's like, right? Right? And it's kind of like somebody coming into your office and going, I want to be a supermodel. And you're like, there's so many things that I have to say to you in this moment. One is, is that the thing that you think you should be? Um, but also, is that achievable? Is that desirable to be a supermodel? Is that what you should be? So we said, you know, maybe there are seven transformations that are about taking something that might feel mildly unachievable, 
and saying, what if you were focusing more about the people that you serve, less about the company and the company's history? What if you made this so simple to use that that becomes the takeaway, is ease and simplicity versus romanticizing the complexity? What if we looked at a greater world bigger than San Francisco and Market Street and we really embraced all the constraints and the nuances that the mega regions have to deal with in bringing this brand to life? How do we get from the car space to the technology space? So when we IPO, this is more of a discussion of we are the Amazon of mobility, not we are a Lyft competitor that also does ride hailing. That's an important distinction. Um, to be able to see cities and cabs not as adversaries but as colleagues, especially since you know LA and Dallas, these are going to be home to the, kind of some of these first you know flying car deployments. So these are going to be the cities that are these two cities, Dallas and Los Angeles. You guys are going to be defining what mobility will look like in the United States. Um, Safety is a soundbite, so a lot of PR spin control on safety, but how do we instrument safety into the product experience itself? And lastly, as we talked about, um, not succumbing to ableism, not succumbing to everybody has the same amount or ability behind the wheel or as a passenger. So they were rallying around an idea called Movement Night's Opportunity, and one of the exciting things was we got to help them define which type of movement. It's one thing to say movement, it's another thing to pick out of, and this was, I think, a, a shortened stack of 50 different movements. Are you a domino movement, which has some, you know, first domino that falls and all the rest have a kind of a kinetic dependency? Is it like a metronome that's ongoing that never stops? Is it something that's banking around a corner? Is it something that is a waveform? And so the team arrived at four unique and differentiated types, types of movement. So one was the creativity of moving through space that actually to think of yourself as you know, a dancer gliding across the stage, you're actually creating lines in space. Thinking about movements that are the organizing of people towards a common cause, also movements. Movements as highly synchronized, precise movements done without any lag, or frictionless movements that don't have any turbulence or kind of friction below, like the wingsuit type of movement. And we found that the movement we were most in love with was actually this bizarre gif of Wiley, Wiley E. Coyote. And the reason why is we could not reconcile what happens when you actually are hailing food, when you actually don't want to move, when it's raining, and when you actually, the last thing you want to do, the last idea, is putting on a jacket and going outside. What is that type of movement? Well, that's you kind of magnetizing and moving the world towards you. And so this magnet is ambivalent in terms of where is the coyote being pulled or is the coyote pulling the world closer? And so we felt like it exists somewhere in that tension of going and getting. How do you express movement if you can't actually move with animation and cells? So we can communicate things like ripples and crests and propulsion. We can do this with simple swipe. We can do these really fast. And Paul Clay famously said the line is a dot that went for a walk. Um, which is just an amazing quote that immediately transforms the way you actually think about form, right? Because we see that line as a dot that's being jogged across you know, the frame, and it's amazing. And so he said, similarly, can we also imagine that a circle is a square that went for a spin? Because if, if you spin a square, it will make a circle. And so he started to think differently about these shapes, and this is the origin of the whole system. So what happens when a square stretches, it becomes a line, and when it folds in, it becomes a triangle. When it spins, it becomes a circle. And I think we're always fighting using motion as a tool that's decorative. Motion is a tool that comes in at the 25th hour to make someone excited about it. <laughs> you know, but you're really using motion as a tool that how something moves is defining some pretty seriously fundamental things about something. I think more and more, this idea of a kinetic identity or a haptic identity or an identity that feels much more tangible is going to be uh, the thing that's going to win out over things that are just purely graphic. Some simple sketches. I think you know, we try to have the right balance between how much time we spend on computers and how much time we spend away from them. And I'm terrified that more and more of these presentations I look at, the more and more of the, the nuggets are all from these analog things. They're like, oh wow, 
that bottom right where somebody was dropping and they boomeranged it and you just saw the thing coming back reminds us it's not about going, it's about coming back to your family, coming back to your colleagues. Um, that nice little chest bump moment, um, though awkwardly bro -y, uh, is a demonstration. It's not about Uber, it's about you're facilitating interactions between two complete strangers that otherwise would not have come together. That's a pretty important thing. Um, so what are you gonna do once those two people come together? Um, in different ways we think about shape, form, and surprise. So this was our quote unquote war room. Um, part of the task was also getting them off of their, bless you, off of the screens to make sure that we weren't all trying to outspeed each other in terms of solutionizing um, something. But we're actually looking at, are there any boundaries between one, two, and three? What if we end up with one super root? That would be okay if the ideas were porous and they all felt authentic. Drawings, trying to understand how, how do we make an air hockey feel like an air hockey puck? Um, all of these conversations. We wanted to make sure the teams didn't feel an anxious about arriving at a solution, so we came up with over 100 ways in which you could make a U into something. Um, to say, believe me, we will cross every bridge. We will have U's as smiles, we have U's as arches, U's as bowls, U's as intersections of two J's. And we created so many of these, we had these just lying around so that no one panicked about not having the answer or not having a answer. It was more about finding the right answer. We had a table of kind objects, and so these were things where we imagined that, you know, and say, hey, driver, I need a stick of gum, and the driver gives you a stick of gum, and you realize on that gum wrapper is a map of the city, maybe the best sunsets and sunrises. A driver is more than a chauffeur or a machine operator. A driver could be the person who unlocks a city for you. So how do we think beyond people's even designated roles? And it might be something where that stick of gum leads you to have a transformational experience in a city. Because we're romanticizing experiences, not the company or the, the imagined experience they're actually having. We use a collaborative platform called NICE, uh, N-I-I-C-E dot C-O, because I know two of you will ask me that after every, every lecture, there's always two. So N-I-I-C-E dot C-O. And it's a platform that's still very bootstrappy, but allows you to do a lot of drag and dropping which allows us to then do time zone hacks, so a way for us to design between three studios. So how do we get a London studio, our San Francisco studio, and our New York studio dragging and dropping dynamic content into one shared platform and not have what I think is called mood board-itis, where designers grab the same mood board and it's probably the same mood board they've used in the previous two or three, and they've gotten so used to this mood board because there's a kind of a comfort to these images, right? They know that they're, they've you know, been successful mood board images before, so they can be successful mood board images again. But I think the danger, not only with the tools, are, are the influences that you're looking at, gestures that are too designed to be influences for a context that was not the task that you're designing for. So I think there's always, for me, a love-hate relationship with looking at mood boards. There are things that truly feel like the coyote to be the epicenter of an actual new idea, and then ones that feel like this is a little bit like training wheels. We're looking at something that has the gravitas of a made and exciting piece of graphic design, but sometimes maybe we need to push away and back to sketches. So we talked to a lot of people, and I think um, talking to people is one of the, uh, the greatest things that designers are not taught that you must do, which is just listening first and then ultimately letting the true constraints emerge, because the constraints that are true might have emerged in the brief. And it reminds me of the parable of the six blind monks. That if you do not actually discuss what's in front of you, you will argue about something that your own experience will dictate that if you're holding the trunk of an elephant, it has to be a boa constrictor. If you happen to be holding the tusk, you're certain that it's a spear or some type of weapon. If you're holding the stomach, you know that it's gotta be a giant boulder you know that if you're holding a tail, it has to be some type of paintbrush, and your own experience cannot let you undo um, the fact that you're allowing that to create tunnel vision, and so these six blind monks are getting into fits with each other because they're not talking. And the conversation helps to stitch together these partial truths, the true nature of what's in front of you that could be right in front of all the teams. So we created these projective tools uh, called the U-cards, and we said, what are your hopes and dreams for this project? I think we had roughly about 25 of these. For some executives, it was light at the end of a tunnel. 
For some, it was that we wanted to be a magnet where we can pull whatever is essential, people or things. They wanted to be facilitators of driver and rider moments. So for some people, it wasn't about the company. It really was about the human-to-human -human interactions. Someone else, it was an escape. It was a hot air balloon. And my favorite says, yeah, I know a lot of people are going to hate mine, but I just think that when it rains, that someone should just offer you an umbrella, which is my favorite. I think as we try to create brands that are everyone's best friend, how do we actually think about what the true kind of unmet needs are? This is me trying to figure out my own unmet needs of trying to hail a car in Jakarta. And you can see by looking at the right, that's a real-time um, video capture that I wasn't probably going to have the best luck hailing a car. The car I think, ends up moving to like 15 different vantage points. And then I realized that I had brought my disease of Americanism with me. You don't hail a car in Jakarta. You ride a motorcycle, silly American. Um, so then I pretended to be a motor motorcycle driver, um, which of course you can tell is fake because the sticker is still on the shield. But this is the point of just saying like, this is really the jacket that I have to wear in this temperature. It's so hot, I can't believe I'm putting on a jacket. Why would I be putting on a jacket? And so all these things have to be what the driver is experiencing. Why are they making me put on this jacket on top? It's already so humid. Why would I possibly be wearing a jacket? And then you're thinking, oh wow, they have to hand someone a helmet and that helmet's been sitting out in sweltering heat. Oh, this whole thing, someone has not been here. <laughs> it's a problem of not been here. And so multimodal mobility, right, is the ability to think of on a single contract the confluence of different modes of transport. And in the future, this is going to be you're going to leave home, possibly have a bike or a moped, then string together public transportation. And that public transportation is going to carry you maybe to a car. So you might have three different modes of, 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 of moving, but they're all unified under one contract. Thus, the benefit would be you would pay subscription revenue, right? Whoever wins your share of subscription, it's like, okay, this is my, month, my monthly mobility bill, and so-and-so is gonna take care of this. And this is why you would choose to go after a multimodal um, platform. And so because of this, and because I had been exposed to so many different modes of transport that I knew the teams in San Francisco weren't talking about, I made a point of making this video for the team to just remind them of all the different ways in which people are moving. Um, with steering wheels on both sides of the streets, people thinking about flying, people thinking about logistics, people thinking about tuk-tuks and um, electric mopeds, and still thinking that they were on the road. And so, you know, car typography feels machine because oftentimes its history is of being machine. So you have these squarish letter forms that have been sanded down, right? So they all kind of look like you start with a metal tile and somebody was like sanding down until you had, you know, a D for Dodge or a U for Uber, and it felt perfectly at home on the grill of a car. The problem was, if we're branching towards other modes of transport, how is this going to be believable? So I actually started with one of my heroes, Paul Renner, in trying to create a typeface based on geometric parts, freeing it from you know, the romance of the, the human hand and, and the calligraph. And so I actually started by trying to do something rather impossible, which is actually to create a unification between Tamil and Latin English, and the idea that Uber could be a typographic switch between any language in the world that it wants to communicate itself in. So the idea that we wouldn't actually have you know, a logotype that would be a logotype that we, we know it, but what are the, the most efficient characters to get in and out of some of the rarest languages of which we would have a presence? And so the right angled R died a painful death. This is Michael Beirut consoling me about painful deaths. Um, and so he actually, just to re reenact it, he had me draw the Uber logo on the, on the screen. So that's what's on the blackboard behind him is that, uh, that Uber R. Uh, so sometimes these things go away. So we thought, okay, what do we have? We, we have this really dramatic ways in which we're talking about light and dark. We mailed these booklets to the CEO because one of the things that's super helpful when you think of back to you know, the Paul Rand books of the 60s and 70s is CEOs have so many things in their mind. The last thing you want to do is be thinking about making a decision in front of a highly loaded and charged group of people that are all saying, is this the logo, is this the logo? And a lot of times they just need to page, you know, page by a book you know, that's dog-eared and they have their own notes and they can come to it on their own times. And specifically, we wanted to to know that he was comfortable looking down at the road, not being on the road, because he was gonna be thinking about flying cars and on-demand aviation. So that would be like a 2,000 foot view um, versus an on-the-road view. So we ended up 
celebrating um, a word mark, not a symbol. This is something we heard from drivers everywhere. They said, please don't give us another symbol because we don't have enough resources to build meaning into it. We need just the cut and dry Uber that we can see a mile away, which gives us the ability to say that we are becoming a tech platform. This is the moment the logo was, was, was approved, which is always rare that you, you capture these moments and you realize how bizarre they are. Um, and then we kept going, um, thinking of ways in which you know, we could make things through creativity that might lessen the fear people would have about self-driving cars. So they have alter egos, like maybe one of them is obsessed with the Beatles and loves Yellow Submarine. Um, maybe one just you know, is all about you know, where we're going, we don't need roads. Or maybe just a Jeff Koons fanatic. But we still felt like we hadn't created something iconic. We still felt like you could hold us accountable for stopping short at the iconic aspect of the brief. We had done enough things that we believe if they delivered on them would help move the needle towards them being respected, not beloved because that would be foolish, but ultimately to think about you know, what is over here on the right if Coca-Cola has that silhouette bottle and Polaroid has that unique distinction of the edge. So we looked at a lot of our most favorite compositions and then the night before, we were putting this together for their design team, um, and this accidentally snapped to the top of this composition and keynote. Someone realized, oh my gosh, it's a giant U. And it's a giant U in negative space. And this, this is, for me, reminded me of the, the FedEx era when the first time someone pointed out the FedEx era, and you're like, oh my goodness. It's a giant U that's been there the whole time. It hasn't been commanding my attention, but now that I see it, I can't unsee it. And could that be a compositional signature that could help unify the whole system? And so we said, we'll just let it, we'll let it do it. So then the U-frame became a compositional signature that allowed us to think about you know, something you could see from 1,000 feet away, because you would see that big, chunky U, and the logo would just be the affirmation of the company that's bringing you this message. And the U-frame also could have details, context, and footage, et cetera, et cetera. What we liked about it is how easy it was to recreate. We can imagine you know, being able to paint a giant rectangle and being able to have essentially a de facto U-frame by using you know, a paint roller and a bucket of white paint, or be able to put together very easily square compositions that celebrate the people and places that we served. Or again, this hyper-efficient language of, I don't need another brand talking at me, but I need, another, I need a brand to know, I just need to get to the airport, and that's all I can think about right now. So designing for five operating systems at once, knowing they all had to launch together. Thinking about uh, different grid structures for languages that are both left to right and right to left, um, and different, different styles of variable letting, um, and really working with Mikkel type on creating and quarterbacking one of the, I, I would say, probably the best type design teams I've ever worked with. Um, we had Weil, who was doing Arabic. We had Shiva, who was doing um, seven dialects um, in India. Um, we had amazing people do Hebrew. Um, so ultimately to think together that when it leaves the United States, could it actually get better versus it degrading? I think most of the people are like, US, boom, we landed it, great, success, yay, here's the brand, and then it has to go uh, to these other regions. A lot of times these teams are ill-equipped to be able to catch a system that's been designed without them being the intended audience. So we asked ourselves, what would a transition between you know, Latin and Hindi Devangari even look like? And could that be something we get inc incredibly excited about? Just the idea of the brand changing language. The mandatory uh, Times Square takeover, which I'm embarrassed to even show, but it's part of the process. And one of my favorite projects, this is from a student at the Bauhaus, uh, Joseph Hartwig, who thought to himself, why is chess such a difficult game to learn? It's as if people are attracted by the difficulty of the learning curve, you know. Um, I won't make a crossfoot analogy, but I think when you look at these pieces, you'll see, wow, each piece tells you how it moves by how it is carved, right? A castle says, I can only move, you know, northwest, east, east and south. The horse basically says, I move in L's. The bishop says, I move in angles. Um, the king and the queen, et cetera, et cetera. And for me, this has always been a perfect piece of design where the intention was one that, why didn't somebody have this intention sooner? Like, to make chess pieces easier to understand, um, is there a romance around their level of difficulty? Well, either way, we thought that safety should have an ability to cut through the system at any moment. So when a lock is locked, it becomes blue. When a helmet is above someone's head, it's blue. When a seatbelt is on, it becomes blue. 
that blue would be the color of safety across the whole product landscape. And they had to use the discipline to only use blue in those moments, demonstrating the physical or emotional well-being of the people they served. Whether those were brake pads, or the spine of a safety handbook, or the edges of a phone, the thing they gave you the assurance that this is Uber looking out for you. We also wanted to make sure that we were looking at colors internationally, and we weren't locking into specific semiotics of what red means in the United States versus what red means in this part of the world. And we realized that basically transportation has this unified symbol of meanings versus this is an arrow, this is why we're using it in this airport, this is what this color means. So that's what became our tertiary palette of colors were these kind of almost like construction, kind of colors and shapes of mobility. And then we had black and white because it had such phenomenal visual contrast. And that's something we heard from all the drivers worldwide. And then safety blue became our color blue, uh, which is 4.58 to one. Um, just making sure that we could teach them about passing visual contrast. And that's only one part of the game, but just mentioning you know, double A and triple A contrast for uh, all their mobile audiences. Looking at typefaces that have a nod towards trans transportation that's been designed with um, either international or highly mobile um, users in mind. So whether it's interstate or highway gothic, you know, Johnson Railway type and the history of underground. Um, Den Miedelschrift, as well as you know, Frutiger and all of his great work in the airports. And so we created a typeface called Uber Move. And the one distinguishing characteristic was this, this characteristic of the road, which for us became symbolic of that lowercase cap U that fuses with a B. Uh, but the, the, for the most part, it's not too fussy. It does have some distinguishing characteristics, so um, we couldn't be blamed for creating a geometric sans. Um, but I think in many ways, you'll see that that stubby G um, is definitely a nice nod to interstate and highway gothic. That um, nice second story A is a nice nod to a lot of kind of 20s and 30s faces. And it starts to feel like it has its own ability to speak to the functional demands of, I press this thing, I know where to stand, and I'm looking for this trade dress that's on this windshield. And this is a nice thank you back to the team in India who really helped us crack this idea of using the arrow as the signature uh, device in a lot of the compositions. These are the type specimens on the day of the launch and our way of kind of thinking our kind of typographic predecessors of Renner, of Johnston, um, Kinnear, et cetera, et cetera. How do you extend this to iconography? So it's not just the typeface, it's the terminus that's carried through to your icons and this language. How does the brand turn down its volume so it's not always shouting, but you can allow the drivers to have their own compositional space? And then in the future, how do you anticipate guiding people using mixed reality? So actually creating iconography that your phone is actually contributing safety blue in dimensional space. And again, things we would have known had we not gone there. Um, thinking about moments in your multimodal journey between riding a bike, locking up your bike, and then waiting to be picked up, that can actually be a branded signature moment for Uber, right? A branded functional object, which marks the place where bikes shift to cars. Or imagining an old deli, um, a U-frame that was simply painted using a roller, or that the trade dresses are all in the rear windshield uh, in deli. And I will, Always loved the fact that this actually was taken out of the side of a car in the middle of a six lane highway um, because they're much better drivers in Delhi than they are in the United States. Um, but we shot this out of a moving highway and I think it was for us important to then shoot billboards and apps that are from the places that you're trying to communicate, which I think is more difficult. But I think it gives the teams reassurance that they understand the name of that store, or they understand exactly where this tree line is. This, this is an important detail. Back to the home front, thinking about our launch. The system coming together, which I think in branding, this is like a big, you know, close your eyes and hope for the best, right? This used to be, I think, the definition of what success was in branding like seven and a half years ago, where you'd arrive at some page like this and go, yay, we did it. And of course, we all know that's not true anymore. And it's really, can the team that you're working with take the system, which might have been a part of a bunch of convoluted meetings, and then take this, take this system with confidence and make better stuff than you could have ever imagined. I think that is the appropriate reset on what success should be. So it means that things like guidelines, you know, we can't wimp out and say, oh, it's a PDF, the excitement's over, we've already sold this in. How do you actually create the excitement 
that we found from discovering that, that motion language that's evident in the guidelines uh, itself. And the product team, um, we earned the right to exist uh, in their space, which is lovely because there were some phenomenal designers which allowed us to think about um, you know, working between you know, different types of software, whether it's you know, Creative Cloud, things like Figma and Sketch, and where these things all intersect. Um, I kept the, the top right one in just as a, a kind of a badge of embarrassment. They were like, of course, the graphic designers would start with car design <laughs> using their own logo. Anyway, um, yeah, don't do that. That's a bad idea. Um, but um, they had some amazing ideas about looking at inspiration from video gaming, from low poly ways in which you're communicating a car because you don't have the memory bandwidth that you do on video games. So giving, creating this for them, um, this is an amazing project where we actually prototyped a, a Skyport in the year 2027 looking at Mount Fuji and trying to create as competent of a render as possible, thinking about what the iconography would be, what the, what the F, FCC and FAA, you know, all these things about it. it's, it's, it's telecommunications, it's aviation, is it a plane, it is a helicopter, all these things that have not been decided yet, whether or not this is gonna be a helicopter or a plane, because there are different rules about what the cockpit will have to be, et cetera, et cetera. But this is the best that we could do with the information that we did. And we said, okay, this feels like you guys are a mobility platform, which is exciting. And then here was the moment where we thought, my goodness, now we've given this impossible system over to a team. Are they gonna be able to catch this? And um, another embarrassing shot of me wearing a crazy onesie. But this is the CEO on the far right side um, congratulating Peter Marcados, you know, after you know, essentially navigating uh, the gauntlet that was executive approval as we had. A C-level that was coming into being from CEO, COO, CMO, those are all newly announced roles, um, all in and around launch. This was um, a piece that was shared to me by the EMEA team, and I was blown away, because it looks better than any of the billboards that we had designed uh, for them notionally. This was an actual billboard in Berlin, working with the street artists, and for us, this was you know, an amazing moment where we hadn't actually thought of like a multi-sided out of home that was this complex, where would the app badges go, um, and for us, it felt remarkable. This was the team's takeover of the Paris Metro. And again, just unbelievable you know, commitment from their in-house team to extend and do something that probably we, we wouldn't have done this soon, filling the U-frame with this much contextual detail, but it looks great, um, it's captivating. Um, the team actually decided to publish 77 things to actually tell the world about universal design, which was a great uh, I think victory for the teams. And this was Uber Light launching um, in India, um, in both Hindi and Canada, and ultimately I think we ended up doing um, eight dialects. Uh, I think we initially had bookmark seven. Um, this is amazing project to be able to see a five megabyte app come to life um, after the UX research basically said that people are downloading a 243 megabyte app and then deleting it after each ride. So if you can just imagine that, shenanigans. So the product team goes, we're gonna fix this. We're gonna take 243, we're gonna subtract however many megs off of that to get a five megabyte app, which means that it has to be incredibly efficient. So what are all the things we actually need to say? It's like, well, blue, black, and white. That's a very simple and pared back system. So ultimately this is the stripped down version, which was so successful they've actually been rolling out uh, Uber Lite to other regions. <laughs> this was the day of the IPO. Um, so it so happened that 99U coincided with the IPO. They invited me down to the stock exchange, which I've been to before, uh, but not something where they've done this much of a takeover, uh, walking through the Oculus, seeing the system come to life, um, you know, walking in front of a, a wrapped colonnade, and just feeling a whole host of emotions. So many people that started the journey weren't there at that moment. So many people that weren't really a part of it were definitely there in a big way. Um, and you realize that, you know, um, these design projects, you know, you never can tell how they're gonna go. You never can tell how they're gonna end up. You can never tell what the company's gonna do with the thing that you've given it. Um, but I think this is one of those things where I look back on already what they've done since the IPO, which is actually combined with public transportation in Denver. They've rolled out Uber Copter in New York. You can take a copter to JFK. They've released a financial services program platform called Uber Money, which we helped name. Um, and you can now take a scuba uh, to see the Great Barrier Reef, which is um, a little ridiculous. Um, 
but they see themselves as a mobility platform, which for us, that was a real secret ambition, is first know that you are more than you know, a double digit you know, ride hailing competitor to someone else, know that you're actually the platform that's deciding um, you know, how the world will move. And so really kind words from Armin, where he says, the potential to be a case study we'll discuss 20 years from now, as long as Uber delivers on positive change. And so after this, I thought I will never, ever, ever do a mobility project ever again. And then um, I had another phone call from um, a company called Lime, and you may be familiar with them. And they said that we are a um, multimodal mobility. I was like, whoa, that's a new mobility. I need to look that one up. Um, so multimodal means basically like you are the platform itself, you're the kind of the Swiss cheese. Micro mobility means you're the holes in the Swiss cheese. So Uber was multimodal, which is basically like all the stops. This actually is a definition, actually I think it should say micro mobile. But if you think about it, first mile and last mile are for the most part always tied to public transportation, meaning that the gap filling that's happening is one, Gap filling, it's gonna to have to happen for all urban metros, specifically because 70% of people are gonna to move to cities. We know these are gonna be, problems are not gonna go away. Um, multimodal companies are troubled with both what they call thick and thin cities, which basically means different levels of density in urban and metros. Micromobility is basically saying we need to get people to public transportation and then from public transportation to wherever they're going. Thus, we will take cars off the road. If we take cars off the road, so for instance, Lime in 2019 surpassed 100 million rides, meaning that the rides had people taken them would have been 25 million miles of car travel, 1.2 million gallons of gas, and 9,000 metric tons um, of carbon emissions. So you start to do the math on this and it starts to become incredibly compelling. How much did we end up doing for them? Um, honestly, we said you guys are doing so many things right that we almost want to do the least that we can do to say yes, green is a phenomenal color. Green is a phenomenal color specifically because that's the color of the bike lane, so whatever you do, don't change green. And it feels like you have a lot of pride in Lime, so just keep the name Lime. And then for us, it was just about actually their mnemonic, which we thought was something that was incredibly catchy. And so we left them with our excitement of their mnemonic. <laughs> and it hops up, and it's like, hey, I'm Lime. Um, so you'll see those rolling out, but I think we wanted to try something different where we actually drew all of the letter forms from the Lime itself, right? So the L is just a, a portion, it was a kind of like a quarter angle of that. Uh, you know, the M takes some sloping details um, from the curvature inside, and the E is drawn alongside um, that angle back through the L. And so for us, it was also exciting to be in a different typographic mindset about what this will be. So I think you, know, you see the issues of you know, if all things are, are not being equal, then you don't even see the, the, the issues because you know, the, the person on the right can't even see above that wall, that partition. And with equity, you're trying to give everyone an equal chance to do something, but the problem is you're still aware of the limitation. I think the big thing is how can these three individuals be free from these obstructions and snags, and then ultimately then we will truly realize the mobility as a service. So I'm officially out of time, but I've left some. I know y'all Back to the Future folks got that one. Um, and I'm done. Thank you so much.